Hello, and welcome back to Curiosity Mine. A Lightning Ridge historian recently brought to my attention a letter that was sent from the curator of the Australian Museum in Sydney to the curator of the British Museum of Natural History in London in 1916. And the letter is about an opalized fossil sample from Lightning Ridge, likely one of the earliest opalized fossils found, and certainly one of the earliest with any documentation about it. The letter itself is not a particularly groundbreaking document. There's no big deal revelations in it. It's just a fun little slice of time that I found pretty interesting, and I hope you do too. Before we look at the letter in detail, let's have a look at a bit of historical context because it's really interesting and kind of important to understand where this letter sits in the timeline of history. Several different kinds of history. Let's start with world history. This letter was written right in the middle of World War I in the early days of the 20th century. London was a very tense place in 1916. The Germans were bombing the heck out of the place. The Natural History Museum, where this letter was addressed, was bombed a number of times, causing damage to structures and to exhibits. There was a secret group of operatives called the Special Operations Executive working out of the Natural History Museum itself to develop covert weapons and strategies to help the Allies win the war. Among the weapons developed in the secret museum spaces were exploding antiquities, so statues and pieces of art cast in high explosives that would be given or sold to enemy representatives and then detonated remotely. Uh, they also made exploding rats, which were basically rats filled with explosives. So the British Museum of Natural History had a lot happening at the time that this letter from the curator of the Australian Museum landed on its curator's desk. Lightning Ridge was pretty new in 1916. The quick timeline of Lightning Ridge history is that Opal was discovered by Jack Murray in 1901, although that's quite a complex story and we'll leave it at that for now. The first real mining efforts occurred in 1903. The town started in 1906. The school police and Cottage Hospital all appeared between 1912 and 1915. Apart from the initial rush of miners in 1905, the first significant rushes didn't occur until between the 10s and 1920s, with a lot of people coming to the town in the period between the World Wars. The oldest surviving miners shack at Lightning Ridge, Fred Bodell's hut, was built in 1916 year this letter was written. Life was very tough at Lightning Ridge during the war years, but the taste for opal was spreading and the community was growing. The three mile opal rush started in around 1908 and swelled over the following decade with the three mile opal field having about a thousand to 1200 miners in 1916 when this letter was written. And the other timeline we need to look at is the timeline of the history of paleontology. Not prehistoric history, but the history of human understanding of paleontology and dinosaurs and other prehistoric life. The whole concept of the dinosaur was conceived in 1841 by grumpy old guy Richard Owen, which is only 75 years prior to 1916. Again, if we consider the rate that technology advances and how very, very slow progress was in science before the advent of modern means of communication, it's not crazy to say that 75 years wasn't that long ago when this letter was written. There were only a few dozen dinosaurs that had been identified by 1916 in comparison to the approximately a oh, thousand dinosaur species that we know today. So this is a letter from 1916 from Robert Etheridge Jr, the curator of the Australian Museum, to Sir Arthur Smith Woodward, Fellow of the Royal Society and curator of the British Museum of Natural History. Robert Etheridge Jr was born in 1846 and died in 1920 and he was curator of the Australian Museum in Sydney from 1895 to 1919. He was a paleontologist, geologist and a gold miner. He travelled back and forth from England to Australia several times as a young man. He was also an eager explorer. He led an expedition to Lord Howe Island in 1888 and over his career he authored over 350 scientific papers. He was a busy boy. The letter was sent to Arthur Smith Woodward of the British Museum, later Sir Arthur Smith Woodward. He was knighted in 1924. Smith Woodward was a geologist, paleontologist and an expert on fossil fish. He was also victim, if you will, to one of the most famous, ridiculous and elaborate hoaxes 
in scientific history, but more on that later. The letter reads, Dear Woodward, I sent you portion cast of a reptilian ramus from the Upper Cretaceous Opal deposits of Lightning Ridge, New South Wales, with the view of obtaining your opinion. The original is here. So Etheridge has sent a plaster cast replica of a fossil to London for help in getting the fossil identified. Creating plaster casts of fossils is a pretty common practice. In this case, Etheridge has sent a casting so that the original would remain with him and not potentially be lost or damaged in the post, which makes a lot of sense. Casts are also a really common thing in museum exhibits because displaying casts instead of displaying original irreplaceable pieces means that they can be displayed to the public without any risk of damage to the the originals. These opalised fossils on display at the Australian Museum in Sydney today are replicas, they're not the original pieces, so the originals can remain safe and be available for research purposes. Using casts or replicas in museums also allows the same pieces to be displayed in multiple museums at the same time, which is pretty awesome because that way people get to see specimens that they couldn't see otherwise. Casts of fossils are also fun because there are some cast pieces in museums which are interesting not only because the original fossil was significant, but also because the casts were made by scientists who are now historically significant. So the casts themselves become a part of paleontological history too. Etheridge identifies the fossil as a reptilian ramus. The ramus is the strong curved part of a bone. There's a mandibular ramus in the jawbone and there's a pelvic ramus in the pelvis. In this case, the fossil is identified as a reptilian mandibular ramus, a jawbone from some kind of prehistoric reptile. As you will see, there are five teeth in the alveolar groove ankylosed to the bottom and supported by the outer alveolar wall. Now first, does this fall within Owen's pleiodont or his pleurodont dentition? So here, Etheridge is describing the fossil piece. He talks about the teeth being in the alveolar groove, which is the gummy ridge just behind your front teeth, and uses the word ankylosed, which means fused together, usually in reference to a joint. Ankylosis is usually something that occurs as a result of disease, like ankylosing spondylitis, where the bones of the spine fuse together as a result of severe arthritis in the spinal joints. But in this case, Etheridge is using the word ankylosed to describe how the teeth in the fossil are fused into the jawbone. He also talks about Owen's pleodont and pleurodont specifications. So Richard Owen is the guy who came up with the term dinosaur or terrible lizard less than a century earlier. And even as late as 1916, his work is still one of the first data sources and references that paleontologists are reaching for. Even today, specimens including teeth are super important in species identification. Teeth tend to fossilize beautifully because they're hard mineralized parts of the body to begin with, and they contain so much unique information about a species from its diet, to its defensive capabilities, to its evolutionary position in relation to other species that have already been identified. I've made a number of videos on this channel about opalized tooth fossils from Lightning Ridge, and a great example of a species identified primarily from tooth fossils is Weewarasaurus pobeni, which you can check out here. A pleodont is a dental arrangement with teeth growing from separate sockets. A pleurodont is an arrangement with multiple teeth growing from the inside of the jawbone, which is something you see in the jaws of some lizards. The word dentition here seems like it might be a typo or an incorrect word. I feel like the right word wants to be definition, but dentition is actually correct. Dentition is the arrangement of teeth in a creature's jaw. Except Ichthyopterygians and Sauropterygians, a few Colonian remains, a Sorescian and those dermal tubercles I once sent you, and which you suggested might be Stegosaurus, I knew of no other remains in our Cretaceans until this little fellow turned up. Ichthyopterygians are dolphin-like reptiles. This word was originally used just to describe ichthyosaurs. We looked at some ichthyosaur fossils in this video but now it's used to describe some ichthyosaur ancestors as well. Etheridge also mentions colonian fossils. This word refers to species of turtle. This part is especially fun as well because Etheridge refers to Stegosaurus in the same thought. So there are no Stegosaurus-like dinosaurs known from Australia, so far at least. So this is a bit of a weird reference. Etheridge must have been speculating based on fossils from other continents. But it's also really interesting to mention right next to colonian or turtle species because when stegosaurus fossils were first studied and paleontologists tried to figure out what they were it was believed that they were bones from very large turtles the idea was that the bony plates that are now understood to stand up 
along the back of the stegosaurus were actually parts of the shell of the creature with the sort of hexagonal shapes of the plates meshing together to make the shell. You can kind of see how they think that, but it's since been largely proven to be incorrect. Still, it's a, it's a fun step in the evolution of our understanding of dinosaurs, and it's really cool to see the connection between stegosaurus and turtles in this letter. Etheridge then goes on to say, I have compared it with the jaws of Australian monitors, geckos, skinks, moloch and chlamydosaurus and have come to the conclusion it can hardly be Lacetillian at all. However, this is for you to decide. There are a few species name drop here, including the moloch, moloch horridus, which is the thorny devil native to Australia, and chlamydosaurus, which is the scientific name for our modern frill-necked lizard. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. It's always a bit weird to see a modern species with saurus on the end of its name, but saur really just means lizard. Chlamydosaurus means cloaked lizard because when a frill neck lizard's frill is down, it kind of looks like it's wearing a little cloak. Whoa. Curiosity Mine is now on Patreon. Patreon is a service that allows you to directly support your favorite creators so they can continue making the content that you love. If you think Curiosity Mine deserves it, please consider checking out the link below for more information on how you can support the channel. If you do, you'll get your name on this list with these awesome people who are supporting the channel already. But now, let's get back to the letter. Etheridge goes on. A kind of wild idea has crossed my mind. Is it a minute ichthyopterygian? Ichthyopterygians, as we mentioned earlier, are dolphin-like reptiles. In this case, Etheridge is suggesting that the fossil could come from a very, very small one, which would be consistent with the size of the piece that he's describing. Etheridge also adds a bit of a postscript to the letter. Hope you are keeping well and not altogether killed by discussions on the Piltdown Skull. Yours faithfully, R. Etheridge, Curator. And what was this Piltdown Skull, you might ask? Well... In 1912, the same year that the Titanic sank, just to put that into some historical context, a fellow by the name of Charles Dawson presented to Arthur Smith Woodward a parcel of fossils he'd obtained from a workman at a gravel pit in Piltdown in the southeast of England. The fossils included some skull fragments and some unidentified bone pieces. Over the following few months, Dawson and Smith Woodward worked at the quarry attempting to find more pieces of the same fossil material, and Dawson managed to locate several more pieces of skull and a fragment of the lower jaw. The general consensus, particularly from Smith Woodward, was that this fossil might represent the missing link between humans and apes. The fossil species was identified as Eoanthropus dawsoni, after Dawson, and over the following years, much research and speculation occurred around the fossil, but no conclusions were reached with regards to its authenticity or its contribution to human evolution. Sir Arthur Smith Woodward passed away in 1944 at the age of 80 years, unfortunately never knowing the true story behind the Piltdown Man fossil, or how he'd been part of one of the greatest scientific hoaxes in history. And by part of, I mean he fell for it. He was unfortunately the sucker. One of the most fascinating things about the Piltdown hoax is that it took the leading scientists of the day, we're talking fellows of the Royal Society here, 41 years to conclusively prove that Charles Dawson had faked the entire thing. And look, there's probably good reason for that. The British reputation was at stake. While the true motivations behind Charles Dawson's actions may never be known, there's some argument to be made that this hoax was part of a space race between the Brits and the Germans at the height of tensions right before World War I. The Germans had recently discovered skull fragments of their own, later legitimately identified as Homo heidelbergensis, which is a valid fossil still considered a very important part of the record of human evolution. The German discovery would have made the British experts very eager to accept a potential fossil find, especially one purporting to be even older than the German discovery, and then to follow it through to a maybe hasty identification. The fossil such as it was, was actually a combination of modern day human skull fragments, pieces of a chimpanzee jaw with the teeth ground down, 
and some pieces that were then filled with compacted dentist's putty and bits of local gravel that had been stained brown. Knowing what the pieces were made of, I kind of wonder how leading scientists fell for it, but it's worth remembering that no one had pulled a hoax of this magnitude before, so no one was prepared for it, and everyone wanted to find exactly what Dawson was purporting to have dug up. In 1953, nine years after the death of Sir Arthur Smith Woodward, the pieces were definitively identified for what they were. Modern bones, pieces of an ape's skull, and various junk stuck together with putty. Unfortunately for Smith Woodward, the latter half of his career was tainted by the fact that he fell for the joke. And unfortunately for the rest of the scientific community, there was a lot of damage control needed because the Piltdown specimens had quite an impact and quite an influence on the interpretations of human evolution and a lot of backpedaling and backtracking and correction needed to be done to get back onto the right track. And of course it's fascinating to see this link, tenuous as it may be, between Lightning Ridge Opalized fossils and one of the most famous missing link hoaxes in scientific history. This letter is kind of awesome and kind of sad because it comes at a time when Sir Arthur Smith Woodward was still being duped by Dawson's fake fossil and Robert Etheridge is just gently ribbing him about it at the end of the letter, not to ever know that the piece was a fraud. The opalized fossil described in the letter to Woodward was reptile, but it was not a dinosaur fossil. The piece is in the collection of the Australian Museum and it looks like this, as per the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Victoria, Volume 29, October 1916. It's not much to look at in those old pictures, in fact I can barely tell if they're photographs or drawings, but thankfully we have some better images from a scientific paper from 2019, so we can get a better look at the piece here. The piece is indeed very obviously a jaw fragment, although it's likely to be an upper jawbone rather than a lower jawbone, as Etheridge initially thought. Later research has identified the piece as being from a crocodilian creature rather than from a dinosaur. It's been through quite a journey of research, having been attributed to a few different species names. Initially it was named Crocodilus celisophensis, and then further research identified it as Isisfordia molnari. And finally they kind of split the difference and it became Isisfordia celisophensis, which is where it's currently classified. The piece is not on display at the Australian Museum, but it forms part of the museum's extended collection behind the scenes. It would stand to reason that Etheridge's cast of the piece may still be in the collection of the Natural History Museum in London, but I have been unable to confirm that. The letter also remains with the Natural History Museum in London, but a digital version can be viewed online as part of the Australian Joint Copying Project. I'll put a link in the description along with a few other references and some further reading. And one last interesting piece of information in this letter is this handwritten note from Arthur Smith Woodward himself, which states, probably crocodilian related to Botosaurus. Botosaurus is a prehistoric crocodile found in Texas, New Jersey and North and South Carolina. With the hindsight of a century of paleontological advancement, this is clearly not correct for this specimen, but it's fun to see a handwritten note, even one that's not correct, scribbled on a letter for future reference by the curator of the British Museum of Natural History. This letter is a great piece of history because it shows us where paleontologists and paleontology were at a point in time. It gives us some insight into the decision making and collaborative process used by the experts over a hundred years ago. And it even gives us a bit of a peek into the personalities of the curators of both the Australian Museum and the Natural History Museum in London, which is pretty fun. This video was made with the help of the Australian Opal Centre and Lost Lightning Ridge. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mine on YouTube and maybe even supporting the channel directly through Patreon. The link is in the description. And thank you for watching.